Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. Our Father, we thank you very much for tonight's Bible study. Thank you for preparing our hearts to listen to your word. I will pray that this word will reach every life in Jesus' name. We are asking Lord, you open our eyes to see, our minds to understand, our hearts to perceive. Open our way, Lord, before you. Let us bring ourselves before you. This word will totally challenge us and enlighten us in Jesus' name. Open the pages of the scriptures to us that we may see and live according to this word. Grant us the grace to live for you and to live in your grace all the days of our lives, that our lives may glorify you every time, everywhere, in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can see that we come to our Bible study tonight. And we're coming to the epistle of John. Uh, that is the first epistle. Last week we started from chapter 1. And we studied verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 already. I just want to remind you that when John wrote, he wrote with a purpose. And the purpose is very clear. I told you last week that when you come to the gospel according to St. John, he's talking about the past. What has happened already? He's talking about Jesus Christ who already came in the flesh. He said in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he said that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And there he spoke about Christ, his miracles, his messages, and then he went to the cross and he died for us. That happened already. And Jesus said, it is finished. As you come to the epistles of John, you're coming to the present, you're coming to our life in Christ, now that we have eternal life, now that we are saved, now that we are born again, it talks about our sanctified life. The other side talks about our salvation. This is about our sanctification. When you come to Revelation, it's talking about the future. And it's talking about the glorification of the church, glorification of the saints, of the believers. As you come to First John in particular, there is a word that comes up often and often. Actually, in this episode alone, just five chapters, the word comes up more than 30 times. And it's the word known. Follow me through First John. As we look at chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 3. And every verse will really look for the word known. He wants you to know. He doesn't want you to be in ignorance, to know the truth. And to know him that is true. And to know that you have eternal life. And that you are passed from death unto life. That you are justified. That you are passed from condemnation unto justification. In chapter 2 I am reading from verse 3. Hereby do we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. It's not beginning to tell us that you know, there are people that say they know the Lord. But the evidence of knowing the Lord is that you know the commandments of God, learn the commandments of God, and interpret, apply those commandments of the Lord, and do them. Look at verse 4. He that says, I know him, that's the word again, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And then as you come to verse 5, it says, but also keepeth his word. In him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. He is talking about the assurance of the believer that as you come to the Lord, you can know, you ought to know that you are a real child of God. Look at verse 11. In verse 11 it says, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not. Now it's talking about the people that, you know, they say, yes, I know him. Yes, I'm born again. Yes, I'm a child of God. But it says he hates his brother. He does not love his brother. He does not have real fellowship, biblical fellowship with his brother or with the brethren. He says he does not know that he's walking in darkness and he knoweth not whither he goeth because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Look at verse 13. I write unto you fathers because ye have known him 
that is from the beginning. You see, over and over, it's saying, you know him, you know the truth, you know the Savior. And I'm writing to you, matured believers, fathers, because you have known him that's from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. And I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. That's the word again, you have known the Father. Welcome to verse 18. It's saying us other thing now that we ought to know. It says, little children, it is the last time. And as she have heard that the Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know. The believers know. We know that the end of the world is coming. And we know that that end is very, in fact, it says, because of the Antichrist we see. Living in the spirit of the Antichrist, acting in the spirit of the Antichrist, it says we know that it is the last time. We read from verse 21, it says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth. That's the word again, to know. You know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie in is of the truth. In verse 29, that's chapter 2. It says, if ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Not only that you know you are born again, you also know that other people are born again. How do you know that? Because they keep the commandments of the Lord because they are righteous. By the grace of God, you can see their transparent lives the truthful lives and the sincere lives. You can see the righteous lives and it says, if you see that evidence then we know that they are born again. Come to chapter 3. In chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 1. Beloved, behold what man of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. We know, but they don't know. It is still making use of that word. And it makes use of the word over and over to tell you that this epistle is for your assurance. For you to know that you are born again, you are a real child of God. And it gives you the evidence by which you will know. It tells us in verse 2, beloved, now are we the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Now he's going to tell us, Anna, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him even as he is. Come to verse 5 there. That's uh, chapter 3, verse 5. It says, and ye know that... He was manifested to take away our sins. That's done already. It's not going to tell us the future. It tells us in verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. I'm just revealing to you that this epistle is something that gives you solid basis for your faith and for your understanding that you're a real child of God. We now come to chapter 4. In chapter 4, it tells us in verse 6, we ought to know there is a spirit of error and the spirit of truth. And it shows us how you can detect which one is the spirit of error and which one is the spirit of truth. It says in chapter 4, verse 6, we have God, and he that knoweth God heareth us. That's how you know. Those who know the Lord, they hear the apostles, they hear the word of God, they accept the word of God, they live by the word of God. It says, he that is not of God, heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We come to chapter 5 and in verse 2. It says, by this we know. It says, you see, when, when John writes, it's not writing in gray. It's not, there's nothing doubtful. It's either black or white. It's either right or left. It's either good or bad. It's either you know God or you do not know God. And it tells us with a note of certainty and assurance. It says, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Chapter 5, verse 18. In verse 18, it says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. It said that so many times now that you shouldn't miss that. That the evidence that you know God, the evidence you are a child of God, the evidence that you actually have the certainty you are going to heaven is that you are keeping his commandment, the commandments of God. And you're not living in sin, you're not practicing sin, you're not habitually sinning. It says, we know 
that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. It's an epistle of assurance. And this epistle then instructs us, instructs the true believer. And the true believer ought to have unshakable assurance, but he also wants the false brethren of the unscriptural assurance. It says in chapter 3, come back to chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse, uh, verse 14 and verse 15. It says, we know that we are passed from death unto life. We know that. How? Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother, tell me the rest, abideth in death. And then he says in verse 15, whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And ye know, you ought to know this, ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Having gone through the whole epistle and the picking out the word, no or being known of him, then you understand that this epistle is uh, to help you so that you'll not be in any doubt at all. You'll have assurance that this is the way to life eternal, and this is the way to show that you have that life eternal. And I pray that as we study, the Lord will open your eyes, the Lord will open your mind, and open your way unto the Lord, so that you'll know this is the way. And you'll be able to walk in that way in Jesus' name. Now we come to verses 5, 6, and 7 of uh, 1 John chapter 1 today. 1 John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. It says, this then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we we'll lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from, tell me out loud, all sin. He cleanses us from all sin. Not that some sins are there which we appreciate and love, we like to keep, we like to cover up, but it cleanses us from all sin. We're looking at the word of God today on the topic, saints fellowship while walking in the light. Saints fellowshipping together while we're walking in the light. You can't fellowship with those who are walking in, in darkness. There are three points we're going to look at in the study. Number one, God's full perfection described as light. God's full perfection described as light. That you'll find in verse 5. It says in verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Point number two, great falsehood and profession of deceived liars. Liars who deceive themselves. Liars who are deceived by Satan. Liars who are deceived by false doctrine. Great falsehood and profession. That's great profession. False profession, though, of deceived liars, those who are deceived, that you'll find in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we we'll lie and do not the truth. Point number three, godly fellowship and purification of disciples' lives. The disciples who are purified by the blood, washed in the blood, cleansed in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. It tells us about their fellowship, godly fellowship, and purification of disciples' lives. Dedicated lives there, devoted lives there. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we are fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. we we'll come to point number one. God's Full perfection described as light. In First John chapter 1 verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light 
and in him is no darkness at all. You see what John the Beloved is saying? He's saying, we heard the message. After that, we declare each unto you. You cannot declare what you have not heard. You cannot tell what you have not learned. You cannot teach other people what you have not studied yourself. It says, we declare this message to you because we heard each of him. He was saying that the apostles, not only John, but all the apostles and all good preachers and all the people who are sent of God, they hear from the Lord. They had heard from the Lord Jesus Christ. And now what they heard from the Lord Jesus Christ, we they knew to be the truth. The absolute truth and the perfect truth and the unshakable truth and the irreversible truth that they were passing across to the people. He said, this is the message. We heard it of him and we're declaring it unto you. Christ was a messenger of God. Christ was a Messiah. He was to declare all the truth about God. He was to make God known. And then this is a summary of the message that Jesus Christ brought about the Heavenly Father. What's the message? God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. When it says light, we need to understand that light is the emblem of holiness, of righteousness, of truth, of knowledge, and of glory as well as purity. When God talks about himself and he says he is holy, that means it's perfect holiness. And there is no unholiness or righteousness in that at all. And all the attributes of God, the nature of God, the character of God, the knowledge of God, the purity of God, the holiness of God, the glory of God, everything is brought in here as the light. When it says God is light, that means it's perfectly pure without any admixture of sin. That means he has all knowledge of everything and of everyone without any ignorance on any subject or on any person. That means it's eternally true. It's light. And there is no error or falsehood that can be traced to him. He is entirely, infinitely holy. And no form of unrighteousness delights him. He doesn't tolerate any form of unrighteousness. God is absolutely perfect. And there is no imperfection in him at all. No imperfection in his son. No imperfection in his spirit. No imperfection in his ways. No imperfection in his plans. No imperfection in his purpose. No imperfection in his heaven. God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. All who dwell and die in darkness will forever be separated from God who is light. God will not admit anyone to heaven, will not admit people of the paths of darkness to heaven because heaven is the eternal place of glory and light. Uh, let, let's look at uh, what the other parts of scripture say about this attribute of God, this character of God, this nature of God, that God is light. In First Timothy chapter 6, First Timothy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 15. It says, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, king of kings and lord of lords, who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. That tells us then the character of God, the nature of God, that is so much light, eternal light, bright light, glowing light, that no man can approach unto, with whom is no, uh, we, with, uh, it says, whom no man has seen, nor can see, to whom, he, to whom be honor and power everlasting. And everybody said, Amen. Then in James chapter 1, we're talking about God who is light. The character of light, as I told you already, is holiness, is purity, is righteousness, is perfection. That's, uh, and is glory as well. In James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights. The Father of lights. 
And so you understand why John was saying, this is the message we heard of him. And it's the same message we're declaring unto you that God is light. It says, uh, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and coming from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness and neither shadow of turning. God is light. In fact, when eventually we get to heaven, I pray we'll get to heaven in Jesus' name. Born again, saved, sanctified, made holy and purified and prepared as part of the bride of Christ. That's how we get to heaven. We'll be there in Jesus' name. When we get there, we'll find that heaven is all glory. Heaven is all light. In Revelation chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 23. Revelation chapter 21 in verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. God is light. And his very presence there will make the sun irrelevant and unnecessary. Because his very presence will brighten the whole place and the lamb is the light thereof. As he talks about God the Father being the light, he also now brings in the, la the, the Lamb. That he is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is also declared as the light. In John chapter 1, reading here from verse 4. John chapter 1, reading from verse 4. Actually, verses 4 and 5. It also says about Jesus Christ. In him was the light, was life. And the life was the light of men. Jesus is light. Complete light without any darkness at all. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Look at verse 9. It says in verse 9, That was a true light, capital L, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The Lord Jesus Christ, that's the true light. That lights every man that comes into the world. Look at John chapter 8. Talking about Jesus Christ also as the light. John chapter 8. We read from verse 12. Then speak Jesus again unto them saying. I am the light of the world. Jesus Christ is light. Again he's going to tell us the conclusion. The corollary for that. Or the consequence of that. If Jesus is light, and you say you are following that Jesus, and you are following the Lord, what happens to your life? What kind of life do you live in the public and in the private, at home and in the church, in the office, or anywhere you find yourself? What kind of life would you live? Look at that verse 12. It says, I'm the light of the world, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In John chapter 12, John chapter 12, reading from verse 35 and verse 36, talking about Jesus Christ still is light. And also there is no darkness in him at all. And uh, the body of Christ, those who are really born again are children of God, they live in that same light. That means they live in the truth. That means they live in righteousness. That means they live a purified life because they are following Jesus Christ to his light. John chapter 12, reading from verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while, and the light is with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. The one who is uh, living a life of darkness, in, dark, in parts of darkness, in the uh, character of darkness, in idol worship, which is darkness, in secret society, which is also darkness, or in doing the activities of the people of the night. That they do not want the light of the day to see to make people see what they're doing. It says they do not know whither they are going. They do not know that they're going to hell. If we're going to heaven, heaven is all light. And our lives, our character, our behavior, everything must be of life, transparent life, so that we'll know that we're actually of the light. Look at verse 36. While ye have light, believe in the light. That means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, so it's light, that ye may be children of light. In John chapter 9, 
John chapter 9, we're reading from verse 5. Here the Lord emphasized again that he is the light of the world. And when that light of the gospel, the light of Christ shines into you, it will turn all the darkness of your life away in Jesus' name. It says that as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. No other light. And no other way of truth, no other way of salvation, no other way to glory. Just the Lord Jesus Christ who has come to save us, who has come to redeem us and to take us out of darkness. What's the implication of that? That God is light. What's the implication of that? That Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, is light. And that in Christ or in God the Father is no darkness at all. What are we to do with that message? What John did with that message, number one, John had that from Christ. What we have heard from him, that will declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. The first thing you have to do with that, believe that message accept that message let that message turn your life around and bring you out of darkness into the light then you declare it to other people acts of the apostles chapter 26 you see the calling of paul the apostle which is the calling of every preacher the calling of every believer that we should show the light to other people and turn them from darkness unto light come to acts of the apostles chapter uh, chapter 26 verse 16 but rise and stand upon thy feet for i have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which i will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the gentiles unto whom now i send thee when god sends you he also protects you he preserves your life the people are too much afraid that you know it's danger over there, the problem over there, and they never can go out to witness. They cannot go out to go and do the will of God or the work of God. The Lord, the Lord said, "I will deliver you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send you." As Paul the apostle went, what did he do? What did he preach? And what was the import and the impact of his message? What did God call him for? And as you go to you to present the gospel to all the people, like John the beloved did, the message word of him that will declare unto you that God is light. What are you supposed to do? Look at verse 18. It says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. That's what you have to do. If you are a soul winner, if you are a real Christian, witnessing for the Lord and witnessing for Christ, here is what you have to do. You turn the people from darkness unto light, and then from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me and when you've done that you know what's going to happen the people will shine forth in the light of the lord this will be the result of their conversion the result of their coming to the lord in first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 9 first peter chapter 2 verse 9 it says but here a chosen generation a royal priesthood an holy people an holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You receive that light of the gospel. Your lives will turn around. And your lives will not be the same again. That happens to everyone that comes to know the Lord. All the character that is shady. All the character that is dubious, all the character that people practice in darkness that uh, mama must not hear this, papa must not hear this, the pastor must not know about this, but all those things, that's the work of darkness. You come out in the light and you live a transparent life and your life will not be like it was in the past. In fact, that's what you are told that now that the end is about coming and Christ is about to come, how we ought to live, we ought to shed off all the work of darkness and live in the righteousness of the Lord and walk in the light. We're looking at Romans chapter 13 verse 12. Romans chapter 13 verse 12. The night is fast spent and the day is at hand. If at the time of Paul the apostle the night was fast spent, how about today? 
If the coming of the Lord was near at that time, how about today? If Jesus is soon to appear, how about today? And if the night is fast spent and the day is at hand, that's the day of the Lord, the day of the coming of the Lord, the day of the rapture of the church, the day when he will take his own saints away. And then all the backsliders and the sinners will be left behind. If that day is very near, what kind of life should you be living today? Living in the light, walking in the light. That's why it says, Say, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, activities of darkness, the behavior of darkness, and all those uh, erroneous things of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly. Dishonesty is of darkness. Stealing is of darkness. And all those things that people do in the night, uh, covenant with the devil, that's of darkness. Witchcraft is of darkness. It says, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and chambering. That's the night, night club life. The drunkenness, that's of that darkness. And all the smoking, whether you are smoking ordinary paper or you are smoking whatever it is, it's of darkness. And it says, get that off your life and not in chimbering, not in wantonness, not in strife and envying. It says, we'll put that off in verse 14. But that she put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. What does that mean? Make no provision for the flesh. That is, don't prepare your body and see if you know your body is looking for how to commit sin. Don't uh, prepare yourself in your dressing, in your attitude, in your demeanor, whatever it is, in your conduct. As if you are uh, tending towards wanting to commit sin. Get nearer and nearer to the perfection of Christ every time. Your body, your body language, your attitude and everything should not be as if you want to commit sin and go back and backslide. You're not backsliding in Jesus name. You should not be a source of temptation to other people too. Provoking them to think of evil and to want to do evil. It says put she on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lost thereof. I pray that a total change, wonderful change will come upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 5. Revelation chapter 22, and we're reading from verse 5. In Revelation 22, reading here from verse 5, it tells us about the glorious city. And there shall be no night there, and they have no need of candle, neither light of the sun, for the, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Somebody says, Amen. Amen. We'll reign with him in Jesus' name. We come back to First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. I read verse 5. Now you understand. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Now verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we profess that we have fellowship with the light and yet we are living in darkness, it says we lie and do not the truth. If we say we love the truth because the truth, light is the truth. If we say we love the truth and yet we abide in error and we support false teaching, false prophet, and all false doctrine, then we lie and not and do not the truth. If we profess we have partnership with the Savior, he is the light of the world. And we say, yes, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I have partnership with the Savior. And yet, at the same time, we, ref we refuse to part with our sins. Then we lie and do not the truth. There's many people that will say, I'm born again. I'm born again. And the life they used to live, they're still living that life. The drunkenness is still there. The uh, adultery is still there. Fornication is still there. Idol worship is still there. The tradition of the world is still there. The dressing of the world is still there. The outlook of the world is still there. And the thinking, loving the world and the things of the world, all that is still there. The Bible says, if you say, if you profess, if you declare, if you testify, 
testify that you are walking in the light, that you are having fellowship with the Lord, and yet you are walking in darkness. You are a liar, and you do not the truth. The Lord is telling us to check up ourselves. If we say we have companionship with the light, and still we keep covenant with darkness, if we profess fellowship with the Holy One, and we're still ungodly, unrighteous, and holy, he said we lie, and do not the truth. If we profess to believe and cherish the truth, and yet we're living in sin, and we're living in evil, then we lie and we're not doing the truth. If we say that we have fellowship with the Father who is light and glory, and yet we live like a Satan, the father of liars, it says we lie and do not the truth. It's telling us that when there is a real change of heart, and we come into the light, our life will be clear. Our lives will be clear. Our lives will be transparent. Our lives will be resplendent. It will, it will show the glory of God and the light of the Lord. And you see, there are many people that you know, just say, I believe, I believe. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. I'm walking in the light. I'm in fellowship with God. They have all these uh, high-sounding testimonies. And then when you check up their lives, they do not have any foundation for the testimony they are trying to give. And that's why John, the beloved, is telling everyone that there is great falsehood and profession of these deceived liars. It's not only here, he said that, look at First John chapter 2 and look at verse 4. First John chapter 2 verse 4. He that says, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Especially as, uh, you know, the church is getting larger and larger. The people that, uh, you know, they just join the church. Uh, if people, some people even join the workforce. Uh, it's like, you know, I'm a worker, I'm a worker. Uh -huh. Tell me your story. I about your life. I about your character. I about your behavior. What do you do in the secret? What do you do in the open? When people are not there, what do you do? If you're still fighting, you're a liar. You're not a Christian. If you're still uh, having all those uh, evil things that you're following after, you're a liar. You're not a Christian because it says, if we say that we know him, he that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. When liars get to heaven, Tell me out loud. No, they won't get to heaven. They would, uh, I'm, I'm of deeper life. Uh -uh, but your life is shallow. I'm of deeper life. But your life is not, it's not righteous. And if that is the case, your title in the church does not take you to heaven. Your ministry in the church does not take you to heaven. And all the profession you make in the church does not take you to heaven. The people call you brother, sister, that does not take you to heaven. They don't know your life. They don't know what you do in the secret. They don't know the thoughts of your hearts. They don't know that you are not obedient to the Lord. Once you put on a kind of garment that shows that uh, that's one of them, that's one of them, everybody thinks you are there. But if you are not there, and if you say that you know him and you are not keeping the commandments of God, you are just lying. And if you die in that condition, I'm sorry for you, that will be hellfire forever. Look at verse 10 there. In verse 10 it says, uh, uh, actually from verse 9, look at verse 9, he that says he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that says is in the light. You know there are so-called uh, Christians of nowadays that know how to fight. They don't know how to make peace with people. How to make peace with people who offend them. Assumed, uh, assumed offense. The offense may be real, may not be real. May be imaginary offense. And there are people that they just pick up a fight immediately. They have hatred in their hearts. Bitterness in their hearts. And the word of God says, He that says is in the light. And then hateth his brother. Hateth his sister. How about hating the wife? I about hating the husband. I about hating your neighbor. I about hating the other worker on the other side. I about, you know, he took this from me, took that from me because of that. There's hatred in your heart. If you die in that condition, you'll be fighting for church and fighting for your rights and fighting for this, fighting for that. You'll go to hell. The hell that liars go. He that says is in the light and, and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. In verse 10, he that loveth his brother. 
father abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him, in verse 11, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth. He's professing, I'm going to heaven. When the, when the Lord comes and he catches the saints up, I'm going to go with them. And there's hatred in the heart. And there's bitterness in the heart. And there's some forgiveness in the heart. It says, such people, they're still walking in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that the darkness has blinded his eyes. I pray the Lord will deliver every one of us in Jesus' name. In First John chapter 4 verse 20, First John chapter 4 verse 20, If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother. Think about that. A man says, I love God and hateth his brother. And you'll be wondering, why should anyone hate another, another person? Even to even the sinner, we shouldn't hate sinners. You're going to preach the gospel to sinners so that they can be saved. How can you give good news to the sinner if you hate him? And then your fellow brother that you say you're on the way to heaven together. How can you hate him? How can you hate somebody who is also a child of God? And every time you see him, every time you see her, every time you think about her, there's something rising up in your heart as if, uh, you know, the ground should swallow him up. You don't want to see him at all. That's not Christianity. That's not being born again. It means you are not born again if you are like that. It doesn't matter who you are. You might be a preacher. You might be a singer. You might be whatever you are. If you have hatred in your heart, the Bible wants you to know that you are not a child of God. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? What the Lord is telling us is that we'll come out of darkness. And it's not just testimony. It's not just profession. I love God. I love the church. I love the Bible. I love this. I love that. It says show it and demonstrate it by the life you live. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 16. They profess that they know God. They're loud in their testimony. You meet them sometimes outside. You try to give a track to somebody. And you can tell, you know, he fights, he quarrels, he you know, has all these uh, kind of aberrant uh, behaviors. And then you try to give a track to him. And you say, oh, you're a Christian? I'm a Christian too. Uh, hi about this. Never mind. Uh, that one doesn't matter. But I am born again. I'm a child of God. I'm going to heaven. They profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work, reprobate. Uh, those are the liars. They deceive themselves. And I pray that you will not be deceived. I said you will not be deceived. Uh, you know, if you are sick, uh, physically, you deceive yourself. And they say, how are you? I'm all right. Instead of receiving help, I'm all right. And then if you're sick spiritually, that spiritually you are backslider. Spiritually you've never, never been born again. And you have never tasted of the love of God. It's bitterness in the heart all the time. Anger in the heart all the time. Unforgiveness in the heart all the time. Fighting, strive, conflict in the heart all the time. You've never been born again. And just because you join a particular church, I'm born again, I'm born again. That's deception. And I pray that that deception, the Lord will take it out of our lives in Jesus' name. In Isaiah chapter 44, I'm reading from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 44. We're looking at verse 20. In verse 20, it says, uh, he feedeth on ashes. It's not feeding on the word of God. He's feeding on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside. The people that are making big, big professions. I have fellowship with him. I fast. I see the Lord. I feel the anointing. I feel the power. And yet they're living in secret adultery. They're living in secret fornication. They're living in stealing. 
They're stealing money from the church and stealing money from their corporation. And yet they're saying, I'm born again, I'm born again. He feeds on ashes. He deceived heart, has turned him aside. And he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? I pray that total deliverance will come to such people today in Jesus' name. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. I'm reading from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 59. We're looking at verse 3. It says, uh, for your hands are defiled with blood. They say they are born again. Abortion is still there. And your fingers with iniquity. Your leaves have uh, spoken lies. And your tongue have muttered perverseness. Not callous for justice. And nor any pleaded for truth. They, th they trust in vanity. And they speak lies. And they conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spiders web. He that eateth of their eggs uh, dies. And uh, that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garment. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity. You see that? Their works are works of iniquity. And on the final day, they might come to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works in your name? And Jesus will tell them, I never knew you depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Their works are works of iniquity. And the acts of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. They're thinking all the time. Thinking evil. Thinking sin. Thinking adultery. Thinking fornication. Thinking how they are going to steal. Thinking how they are going to be like the world. It says their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their past. Look at verse 8. The way of peace they know not. Husband and wife. The way of peace they know not. But they preach. Never mind. The way of peace they know not. Fellow believers in the church. They cannot greet each other. You know why? The way of peace they know not. The first one is saved and sanctified. The other one is saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost. And the way of peace they know not. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. When we are born again, the peace enters into our hearts. And then it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. But the people, instead of making peace between people who misunderstand each other, they will be putting fire into uh, the relationship. The way of peace, they know not. If we are born again and we are children of God and we are not deceiving ourselves, there will be peace, there will be love, there will be gentleness, there will be the fruit of the Spirit. It says in verse 8, the way of peace, they know not, and there is no judgment, no justice in their goings. They have made their, them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. I pray that the peace of God will turn everything around in our lives in Jesus' name. It tells us in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Those who profess that they know God, but in reality they do not know him. Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor. And thy patience, and how thou canst not bear with them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say, the people who say, you have tried them who say, they are apostles, and are not, and has found them liars. The people that refer to themselves as bishop and bishop or prophet or whatever. And yet when you look at their lives, you say this is not real. This cannot be true. And these people say they're apostles making big profession, great profession. And yet it says you found them to be liars. If you happen to be in that condition, I pray that you repent in Jesus' name. Because if you don't repent, look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, I'm reading here from verse 8. It says, For the fearful, unbelieving, and abominable, and the all mongers, 
and the murderers and the all mongers, those are the adulterers and the adulteresses and the fornicators and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars. How many liars? All liars, it, shall, it says, they shall have their part in the lake which burn it with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That means then the people who are saying, we know him and we're fellowship with him. And yet they are walking in darkness, it says, they do not know the Lord. The Lord himself is uh, the light. And if we're going to fellowship with the Lord, we'll not walk in darkness. Saying that we're following the light and walking in darkness as uh, an obvious lie and a great uh, contradiction. If we live in sin, it is a proof that our profession of salvation is false. We're deceived and we're deceiving ourselves if we think that we cannot fellowship with God and yet live in the habit and practice of sin as God is pure, as God is holy, as God is righteous, so must we be if we would have fellowship with him here on earth and also there in eternity. There is an irreconcilable contradiction between a life of sin and fellowship with God. True fellowship with God is light. True fellowship with God is peace. True fellowship with God is purity. True fellowship with God is truth and habitual lifestyle of holiness and righteousness. We come to point number three now and we're coming to First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 5 even though we're now coming to verse 7 so you can get the flow of everything the Lord is revealing unto us. First John chapter 1, we're looking at verse 5. It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we we'll lie and do not the truth. Verse 7, But... If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. We come to this uh, godly fellowship and the purification of the life of the disciples. If you look at uh, John chapter 8, you'll find that a woman was taken in the very act of adultery. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. He didn't say, neither do I condemn adultery. He condemns adultery. Neither do I condemn fornication. Of course, he condemns fornication. Neither do I condemn stealing. Of course, he condemns stealing. He condemns the sin. But he's willing to forgive the repentant sinner. That's what he's saying there. Look at this in John chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? As no man condemned thee. Not the sin. We condemn the sin. The Bible condemns the sin. God condemns the sin. Society condemns the sin. Angels condemn the sin. Everybody in every generation condemns the sin. But the man or the woman that calls for forgiveness before the Lord, that is penitent, that is sorrowful, that is repentant, that says, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'm sorry for what I've done. If I have a chance to be forgiven and pardoned, I will not go there anymore. I want Jesus to save me. The Lord is saying, whosoever cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Then he forgives. That's what he, that's what he means. Now, she said, no man, Lord. Jesus answered and said, neither do I condemn thee. Now tell me the rest. Tell me out loud. Tell me as if you were sure. Tell me as if you want that to happen to you. Go and sin no more. He condemned the sin. He said, the sin is not good. That will drag you to hell. You'll perish if you continue like that. Therefore, I do not condemn you now. I forgive you. I give you salvation, eternal life. But go and sin no more. And then when that happens, you are forgiven. I'm forgiven. You are saved. I'm saved. You are sanctified and I'm sanctified. Then it says we now, we live in fellowship together. We live with the understanding that we are members of the same family of God together. There will be no strife. There will be no evil. It will be real fellowship. Come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. 
Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this unto a generation. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them. How many? About 3,000 souls. Look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Doctrine and fellowship. Some people say fellowship is what matters. Forget about doctrine. Uh -uh. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Why? Because what we have heard of him, that will declare unto you. That's the doctrine. That one comes forth. As you accept that doctrine, you accept that teaching, it affects your life. It turns your life around. Now we can be in fellowship together. You are now walking in the light of that truth you have learned. And then we have fellowship with one another. Because the blood of Jesus Christ is son cleanseth us from all sin. Let's come back to 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. 1 John chapter 1, we're looking at verse 7. It says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That word fellowship. Many people do not understand what is fellowship by the way. How do we know that uh, you know you are in fellowship together with the people of God? Or do we just say, okay, I come to church, therefore I'm in fellowship. I shake hands with my brother, therefore I'm in fellowship. I smile when I see him, so I'm in fellowship. And there are other things going on in life. Let me uh, uh, help you with that uh, fellowship as the Bible teaches us that when you are in fellowship with the brethren, here is what will see. But uh, there are two parts. There are two sides to the coin. The one side of the coin is what will not happen if you're in true fellowship. What will not be taking place if you're in true fellowship. That's the negative side. And then the other thing is what will be happening if you're in true fellowship. And you understand it says we have fellowship one with another. If you're in real fellowship with one another, the first part of things that will not happen is F, fear not. You don't fear the person you're in fellowship with. Because uh, you know, a fear is gone. Fear brings torment. If you're feeling tormented in the presence of somebody, you're not in fellowship with that person. Look at First John chapter 4 verse 18. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. If there's a real fellowship, I don't fear you, you don't fear me. We don't fear each other, because there's fellowship. He means that you don't envy each other. There's no envy where there's real fellowship. I'm happy with the blessings of God. You're happy with the blessings of God. If I'm uh, getting higher, if I'm, you know, happy, if I'm, you know, successful, you're happy. You're not envying me. I'm not envying you. Galatians, I'm reading chapter 5, and we're looking at verse 26. Galatians chapter 5, and we're looking at verse 26. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another other envying one another where there's fellowship there's no fear where there's fellowship there's no envy uh, l lie not one to the other you know if you're in fellowship with uh, you know somebody you're not being lying to that person if there's lie you're not in fellowship you fear not you envy not you lie not colossians chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 9 colossians chapter 3 verse 9 lie not one to another seeing ye have put off the old man with his deeds and if you're in fellowship you do not lost lost not lost not fear not envy not lie not lost not you're not lost after their beauty you're not lost after their looks you're not lost after their appearance you're not lost because lost uh, that, that's uh, like you want to commit sin that's not fellowship you want to lead them from light to darkness that's not fellowship you want to lead them from righteousness to unrighteousness that's not fellowship if there's lost in your heart towards another person or towards their property or whatever that's not fellowship that's that's seen. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 6. Now these things were our example to the intent we should not lost after evil things as they also lost it. Lost not. Oppressed not. 
If you are in fellowship with uh, somebody, you'll not be oppressing them. You'll not take joy in their sorrow. You'll not take joy in their suffering. You will not want to, you know, hammer them and knock them and, and do evil to them or make them sorrowful or make them cry. If you're like that, it means that there's wickedness in your heart. You're not in fellowship with the other person, the husband that wants the, you know, the wife to be sorrowful, the wife that wants the husband to be tripped and to fall or to be disgraced. That's not fellowship. If there's fellowship, you oppress not. We're looking at um, Leviticus chapter 25 and I'm reading from verse 17. Leviticus chapter 25 verse 17. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God for I am the Lord your God. Where there's true fellowship, there's no oppression. And then uh, W there with Withhold not, withhold not. Look at uh, Proverbs, I'm reading from chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 27. Proverbs chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 27. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. If you're in real fellowship with the brethren, you have something and they need that thing. You will not withhold. You, they need a word. You'll not withhold. They need a promise. You'll not withhold. They need prayer. You'll not withhold. You need, uh, they need material things. You'll not withhold. That is fellowship. But if, uh, you know, you withhold every good thing you have from everybody around you, you never, you know, have any kind of a uh, heart of compassion, powers of compassion towards anybody. There's no fellowship there. If there is fellowship with Hold not good from them to whom it is due when it's in the power of thine hand to do it. Verse 28, say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. Yes, speak not evil of your brother, of your sister. You know, you cannot be in fellowship with somebody when at their back you're speaking evil of them. There's a dagger from, coming from your mouth, coming from your tongue. And you are killing them with your words. You blaspheme, you gossip, you, you whisper, you do all those things and tell tales about other people. And yet you say, oh, we're in fellowship. When you see each other, then you smile and laugh. Oh, my brother, my brother, sister, how are you? That's not real. That's hypocrisy. And those are the people that say they're in fellowship and yet they're walking in darkness. But if you're in true fellowship, you fear not, you envy not, you lie not, you lost not, you oppress not, you withhold not, you speak not evil. James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Age you hate not. Hate not. If you're in real fellowship, you cannot be having hatred in your heart against your brother, against your sister, and they'll say, I'm born again, I'm a child of God, I'm part of the body of Christ, I'm blah, 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 all those uh, kinds of things. And yet there's hatred in the heart. If there's real fellowship, you hate not. Leviticus chapter 19, and I'm reading from verse 17. Leviticus chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. There are some people that know how to manage hatred. They know how to cover up hatred. They can smile. They can shake your hands. They can greet you. They can say, how are you? Isn't today wonderful? And then you can discuss with them and they can hide the hatred in their heart. It will never come up. But they have it in their heart. And when they have opportunity, they will strike like a snake. That's not fellowship. If you have fellowship, you will not hate your brother even in your heart, I imagine not evil against your brother. Imagine not evil. The people that are full of imagination, uh, they are already, you know, they are coughing out something, something that has not really happened. They are imagining he must have, he must have done something bad. He must have done that. He must have done that. They imagine evil against their brother, against their sister. Husband imagining evil against the wife. Wives imagining evil against the husband. And brethren imagining evil against each other. That's no fellowship. Look at uh, Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 10. And oppress not the widow. 
nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. Let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Imagine not evil. And now be partake not of sin. That he said, uh, there are other people, there are people in the fellowship, and somebody is backsliding. He said, uh, doing something wrong. I said, okay, we're in fellowship, we're in fellowship. And because we're in fellowship, you are partaking of their sin. No, you don't do that. Fellowship does not uh, mean you will uh, partake of evil with others. In fact, your fellowship will make you to rebuke them. You rebuke the people that are going back into evil and are going back into sin. You're saying, no, that's not right. That cannot be right. And you rebuild their lives in First Timothy chapter five. I'm reading from verse twenty-two. First Timothy chapter five, verse twenty-two. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Don't sin with other people. We're in fellowship. And because we're in fellowship, we belong to the same area. We belong to the same work area. And because we belong to the same work area, is practicing evil as supporting. I will defend him. I will do it with him. I will partake of that with him. That's not fellowship. It's going to hell. You want to go to hell with him. No, you don't want to do that. It says, be partakers, uh, be, uh, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. That's one side of fellowship. That's the side, the negative side. Fear not, you're in fellowship. Envy not, you're in fellowship. Lie not, you're in fellowship. Lust not, you're in fellowship. Oppress not, you're in fellowship. Withhold not good from other people, you're in fellowship. Speak not evil of your neighbor, you're in fellowship. Hate not, your brother, you're in fellowship. Imagine not evil, you're in fellowship. Partake not of their sin, then you're in fellowship. The, uh, the other side now, which is positive side, those are the things you don't do because you're in fellowship. These are the things now you do because you're in fellowship. F, forgive and forbear. That's fellowship. When you are in fellowship, uh, you know, with people, with the church, with the people of God, you forgive and you forbear. It tells us in Colossians chapter 3 verse 13, Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 13. It says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgive you, so also do ye. That's how we know we're in fellowship. Somebody has mistakenly stepped on your toes. So maybe it was careless. It wasn't a mistake. It was careless. But it says, as Christ has forgiven you, if we're in real fellowship in the church, it says, forgive Forgiveness will be the very first thing that you do. Husband and wife, there will be forgiveness and forbearance. And parents and children, there will be forbearance and forgiveness. And members of the church, among workers, among members, among leaders to members, members to leaders, there will be forgiveness, no retaliation, no fighting back, no strife, and no conflict. You forgive and you forbear one. Then he is to edify and to exalt. You edify and you exalt. It tells us in, um, in uh, Romans chapter 14 verse 19. Romans chapter 14. And we're reading here from verse uh, 19. Uh, fellowship makes us to edify other people. Somebody comes to you and you're discussing together, relating together, interacting together. They feel lighted and they feel lifted up and they feel edified they feel challenged they feel comforted because you are in fellowship with them romans chapter 14 i'm reading from verse 19 let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace not for strife not for fighting not for violence. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify another. Edify another. In uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. We're reading from verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 13. You edify, you exalt. It says, but exalt one another daily. Encourage one another daily. 
preach to one another daily and uh, challenge one another daily. Challenge people to holiness. Challenge people to righteousness. Challenge people to live a better life, a deeper life, a higher life, a greater life in the grace of God. But exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. When in fellowship, what we do, we forgive and forbear one another and we edify, we exhort one another. Then when love, L is to love. When love one another. In John chapter 13, John chapter 13, reading from verse 34 and verse 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that she love one another as I have loved you, that she also love one another. You see there, as I have loved you, as I I have loved you, not as David loved Shimei. I forgive you, but in his heart he's still thinking of, I'll pass this on to Solomon. Solomon, use your wisdom. After I'm gone, deal with that man, not like that. As I, Christ, have loved you, love one another. If you're not following that standard, you're not following the New Testament. You still have the Adamic nature inside you. And that Adamic nature will sink you down to hell. But if you come to Christ and you uproot that sin, every plant my heavenly father has not planted, you allow the father to uproot it from your heart. No hatred, no animosity, no kind of a wisdom that knows how to retaliate. Not that. It says that you love one another by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love one to another. Not only that, you are also like minded. Like minded. Not that I like to be different. I like to, you know, distinguish myself. If they are all going this way, I like to go the other direction. I always like opposition. I always like to be contrary. I isolate myself and I don't want to be like any other person. I don't want to, you know, follow along with them. If there is fellowship, you'll be like minded. You love what we love. You like what we like. You go the same direction we're going. You know that this is what we love and is for the edification of the body of Christ. You, you align yourself with that. Look at Romans chapter 15 in verse 5. Romans chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 5. It says, now. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another. Like-minded one toward another. Uh, there are some people, something is good, and because brother so and so raised that thing, uh, because his brother and so that first spoke about that thing, even though it is good, I'm going to oppose it. I'm going to find every reason I can get to oppose that thing. Because once brother and so says this, and if we do it, you'll think it's wise. You think it's all right. You think it's a good person. But if there is an opposing force, they will know it's not as wise as they thought after all. Uh, that's not Christianity. That's the flesh. That's sinning. That's self coming to the surface. But for us to be like-minded, that means we're in fellowship together and the people of the world can see us and say, see how they love one another. See how they relate together. See how they're in fellowship. Because they're in fellowship, they forgive and forbear with one another. They're in fellowship, they edify, they exhort one another. They're in fellowship, they love each other. They're in fellowship, they're like-minded. They're in fellowship, they observe the word without partiality. Observe without partiality. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 21. First Timothy chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 21. It says, I charge thee, therefore, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that she observe these things without preferring one before another doing nothing by partiality. No double standard. The same standard that you find I'm relating with this brother and then I'm relating with this other sister. The same standard. But uh, you know, the people are not in real fellowship. They will excuse this one they excuse that one. If this other person does that, uh -huh, then they jump on that person and they are tough and hard. 
That's no fellowship. That's no fellowship. You observe these things without preferring one above the other. One before the other. And you do nothing by partiality. It is that observation of the word of God in a regular way like that without impartiality. That's what we call fellowship. And then W will weep with one another. Somebody is sorrowful. Somebody is having problems. Somebody is having challenge. The fellowship is that we're able to suffer. We're able to weep with each other. That's in Romans chapter 12 verse 15. Romans chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that do weep. We don't find him in the arts fellowship. We don't find high in the church. We don't find high in the neighborhood. What's happening to brother so and so? What's happening to sister so and so? We check up on them and if they're weeping, if they're sorrowful, if they have a problem because we're in fellowship together we weep with the people that weep and yes, we serve one another. Serve one another. It's not like you know I'm sitting back there I want the rest of the people to serve me and then I'm judging them. That one is not good enough. That one is not good enough. That one is not good enough. That brother should stand up now. That brother should sit down now. This, you know, we're there like, you know, a quiet, self-appointed controller, commander. That's not right. That's not fellowship. You're isolated there on your ivory tower and then as you are there, it's like, they should do it that way. They should do it that way. That's not fellowship. But you come alongside with us. We're carrying a heavy load. you carry with with us. We're going in a particular direction. You do that with us. You're serving us as we're trying to serve you. Not that you are just there and uh, you know you don't render any service at all to help us and to encourage us and to lead us on. And you're just there to kind of clamp on us and you know uh, batter us or whatever. Whatever you want to do. That, that's, that's not fellowship. Fellowship means that you are ready to serve one another. Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 13. Galatians chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 13. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 it says, for brethren ye have been called um, unto liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love serve one another by love serve one another that's fellowship when you what can i do to help the fellowship what can i do to lift my brother up what can i do to lead my sister up how can i solve the problem that sister has how can i solve the problem the the, the brother has and uh, that's how to have fellowship together you forgive and you forbear you edify you exalt you love you're like-minded you observe the word without partiality you you weep with those who weep and you serve one another and then each you are humble before each other humble with each other and not that you know you're so proud and pompous you know it all and the rest of the people they know nothing and there's no humility at all in our relationship and you can see the air of pride that some people have they look down on everybody else what would you say what can you do when did you come we are the number one here. We are the most important, uh, you know, people here. So, okay, talk. What do you want to say? Uh, that's not fellowship. You make the fellow look like, uh, you know, a rag. You make the fellow look like a footmatch. And then you, you are the ivory tower person there. That's not fellowship. But you bend low and uh, you are humble. And then we're able to, the left hand is washing the right hand. The right hand is washing the left. And there is no distinction. There is no differentiation between this and that, and uh, that's in First Peter chapter five, verse five. First Peter chapter five, verse five. But likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with what? With humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. He wants us to be humble one before the other. I is to intercede, intercede one for the other. If somebody has a challenge, somebody has a problem, intercede and pray one for another. That's a fellowship. But when somebody has a problem and there's nobody to lift up his hand, nobody to grant him a, you know, kind of a solace, nobody to make supplication, nobody to pray. And uh, you know, we leave all the prayers in the hands of uh, our local pastor, our group uh, pastor, and uh, you know, we cannot pray for each other. 
brother. That's not fellowship. Fellowship means we we'll intercede one for the other. We're looking at James chapter 5 verse 16. James chapter 5 verse 16. Confess your first one to the other, one to all another and pray one for another that she may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. F is to forgive and forbear. That's fellowship. And E is to edify and exhort. That's fellowship. L is to love. The next L is to be like-minded. And then is to observe the word of God without partiality. Is to weep with one another, serve one another, humble ourselves before each other, and intercede one for the other. P is to prefer others above ourselves. Prefer others above ourselves. The attitude of me first, me only, and me alone, that's not fellowship. The one that wants to eat all the food available, that's not fellowship. The one that wants to drink all the water available, that's not a fellowship. And the one that wants to be served, you know, everything everything should gravitate around him and towards him. And he's the only one that should be happy, the only one that should be exalted, the only one that should have whatever it is. Whatever happens to other people, that's none of his concern. That's not fellowship, but the one that prefers other people. He has a greater challenge than mine, attend to him. He has a greater problem than I bear, attend to her. And that's fellowship when you prefer other people above yourself. We're looking at Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Romans chapter 12 verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another in honor preferring one another the lord has called us to fellowship fellowship with one another and as uh, we look at our lives and we see that uh, we have not uh, been in fellowship the way he wants us to be in fellowship it's not to condemn us it's to go back to calvary to go back to the cross go back to christ and say lord i'm not there yet i want to be there we'll be there in jesus name and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanseth us from all sin you know all unrighteousness you know if a husband and wife will go through this fellowship together there'll be no separation there'll be no divorce there'll be no pride there'll be no oppression we will you know love each other fellowship with each other if the church members of the church ministers in the church if we really follow through this fellowship which is all in the scriptures there'll be no oppression there'll be nobody saying i'm going to leave the church for him i'm going to leave the church for her if that is the way they will judge our case and all that I, i'm not interested anymore they talk about sun doctrine but they are following another method there'll be nothing like that there'll be fellowship from today, there will be fellowship in Jesus' name. You fear not one another. You envy not one another. You lie not one to another. You lost not. You oppress not. You withhold not what is good from other people. You speak not evil of other people. You hate not other people. You imagine not evil. You partake not of evil. But you forgive and you forbear. You edify and you exalt. You love. You are like-minded towards each other. You observe the word of God without partiality. You weep with the people who are weeping. You serve one another in love. You are humble before each other and you intercede for each other you prefer one above the other the trumpet may so sound we shall go together in fellowship in jesus name let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer you tell the lord you know what we have learned today god is light in, in him is no darkness at all let that light of the gospel the light of god let it shine in your heart if we say we have fellowship with him and we're walking in darkness we do know the truth we lie and do know the truth but if we walk in the light if we walk in the light and cease in the light then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his only begotten son cleanses us from all sin let him cleanse you let him make your life richer and better and higher and deeper let the grace of god be more in your life today his grace is sufficient for you it can make you the kind of christian you ought to be